Hello everyone, welcome back for more human physiology. So let's go ahead and finish off this particular communication video series by talking about how certain types of homeostasis loops are going to look a little bit different depending on which method of long distance communication that we choose to use. So let's get into this. So the first is what we're going to call the simple endocrine reflex. So we're going to see quite a bit of this in chapter 17 when we start talking about the endocrine system. So in this case, with a simple endocrine reflex, what this basically means is that the nervous system is pretty much uninvolved, meaning that the brain and the spinal cord are not going to be acting as control centers here. Rather, your control center is going to be a single endocrine gland. So... The idea here is that, as we've discussed, an endocrine gland is basically any tissue or organ that both synthesizes and secretes a particular type of hormone. And as we said in previous discussions, these hormones are basically just messages that are being sent all throughout the body by using the bloodstream. We are sending messages about, this is what our problem is, this is how we're going to fix it, right? So some examples of endocrine glands that we will talk about in chapter 17. So you've got things like the pancreas, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, the pituitary, the hypothalamus. So we'll talk about that plenty in chapter 17. And then some hormones that these glands might secrete would include insulin if you're talking about the pancreas, thyroxin if you're talking about the thyroid, cortisol if you're talking about the adrenals, uh, human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, so the list kind of goes on and on there. So in these cases, your output signal is always going to be whatever hormone is secreted by your endocrine gland of interest. So you have to think about it this way. The hormone is a message. Your output signal is a message. So in a simple endocrine reflex, these things are one and the same. So if you look at the flow chart in the far right, you'll notice that in the yellow circle, we have, of course, our stimulus, meaning some parameter is below or above its acceptable normal range. But what you're going to notice here is that we seem to lack a dedicated sensor. And this is because in a simple endocrine reflex, your endocrine gland, in addition to its duties as the control center, it is also acting as the sensor in this regard. What this means, since the sensor and the control center are the same thing, we do not need an input signal here. So that is kind of nice in terms of how it simplifies it. So what you may want to do here is go back to chapter one when we talked about high blood glucose as an example of a homeostasis feedback loop. And you may want to, with your extra bit of context and information now, go back and try to map this out in the framework of a simple endocrine reflex. So uh, just very quickly, your high blood glucose would be the stimulus. The pancreas, of course, would be both the sensor and the control center. It senses the high blood glucose and then decides what it's going to do with that. Insulin, the hormone insulin itself, would be the output signal, and then your targets would be the different cells and tissues that respond, meaning the liver, the adipose tissue, and the skeletal muscle. So one very important point to make before we move on here is that in a simple endocrine reflex, your targets or effectors, whatever they may be, are only going to be targets and effectors if they have receptors for that particular hormone. And as we said before, and as we will say again and again as we move on into chapter 17, a particular cell can only respond to a particular ligand if it has a receptor for that ligand. So in this case, your target or effector stands out from other cells in the body because it has the appropriate receptor, meaning it's capable of giving us our response. So a neural reflex is going to look a little bit more familiar to us. So if you look at the far right flowchart here, you'll notice all the things that we've discussed before. You've got, a sen you've got a stimulus, a sensor, an afferent input signal, a control center, a efferent output signal, an effector, and a response. So this is kind of what your prototypical homeostasis loop looks like. <clears throat> 
So hence the name, a neural reflex is where you basically use exclusively the nervous system, right? So uh, as you might expect, your control center is going to be either the brain or the spinal cord, more typically the brain. Your output and input signals are going to be carried by neurons through their axons, meaning our messages will be traveling through nerves rather than hormones traveling through the blood. So sensors in this case are a type of neuron which is called a sensory neuron. So the sensory neurons are capable of not only acting as the sensor of having sensory receptors, but it also sends the input afferent signal through its axon in the direction of the central nervous system. So when the brain or the spinal cord, whichever one it may be, receives that afferent information from the sensory neuron, it then obviously processes the information and then sends another efferent message out through a new type of neuron, which is called a motor neuron. The motor neuron carries the information the opposite way. This time we are going from the CNS, from the central nervous system, to wherever the effectors may be. Usually those are going to be muscles. So this picture here should give you a better idea of kind of how a neural reflex works. So our stimulus should ideally be located in the same location as where our sensory receptors are located. These sensory receptors are a part of the sensory neuron so what's going to happen here is that that stimulus is going to stimulate those sensory receptors in such a way that the sensory neuron produces an action potential, meaning it sends an electrical message through its axon and into the central nervous system, either into the spinal cord or into the brain. So here, the spinal cord acts as our control center, and then once it's done processing its information, it sends the efferent information out through the motor neuron. So the motor neuron similarly is going to fire an action potential, and this information will eventually be delivered to the effector. Like I said, that's usually going to be some type of muscle tissue, and then that muscle tissue will contract or relax in whichever way is necessary to give us our desired response. So the sensory neuron contains those sensory receptors that we need to pick up on the stimulus, and then it sends a message to the control center, and then eventually the efferent motor neuron will send that information back away from the central nervous system to the effector, whichever it may be. So the reason the effector is able to produce a response for us is because it has receptors for whichever neurotransmitter is going to be released or secreted by that motor neuron. So there is still some similarity here with the simple endocrine reflex. In the simple endocrine reflex, the effector had to have receptors for that particular hormone. Well here, the effector has to have receptors for that particular neurotransmitter, so maybe things have not changed that much. So the final type of reflex that we're going to talk about is going to seem a little bit complicated. So this is called the neuroendocrine reflex. And as the name kind of indicates to you, it is basically a combination or a hodgepodge of both the simple endocrine and simple neural reflex. So basically this involves both the nervous system and the endocrine system working together to accomplish a certain type of task. So the main reason this is going to seem a little bit complicated is because this is where we first start to see a particular homeostasis loop having more than one control center. So in a typical neuroendocrine reflex, you're going to have one control center that is in the nervous system and one control center that is in the endocrine system. Otherwise, everything is going to be pretty much the same. Essentially, the top half or first half chronologically of a neuroendocrine reflex is going to be the neural part of this, and then the bottom half or second half chronologically is going to be the endocrine part of this. So if we wanted to try to map this out using that positive feedback childbirth scenario that we talked about in chapter one, things can maybe make a little bit more sense. So if you recall, when a baby is ready to be born, 
it starts placing pressure on the cervix, right? So that would be our stimulus up here, an increase in pressure on the cervix. The receptor, in this case, the sensor, is the what we'll call nerve endings of a particular sensory afferent neuron that has its sensory receptors in the cervix. So this sensory neuron is going to fire an action potential that travels through nerves into the spinal cord and up to the brain. So there's our brain. That is our first integrating or control center here is the brain. So it is going to then send a message through a motor neuron. Typically in a neural reflex, this motor neuron would deliver a message directly to the effector. But in this case, that message is going to our next control center. In this case, our endocrine control center. That endocrine, con excuse me, that endocrine control center is located in the posterior pituitary. So there's our second control center. The posterior pituitary will then produce its output signal, which is a hormone. And that hormone, of course, is oxytocin. Oxytocin will travel through the blood until it gets to its effectors, which is the smooth muscle myometrium, that middle layer of the uterus, which is going to produce contractions that we need in order to get our response, which is that the baby gets pushed, it places more pressure on the cervix, and then that's how we get our positive, feed loop, uh, positive feedback loop here until the baby is eventually born. So just in this uh, table that you're looking at right here, we are directly comparing the neural reflex with the endocrine reflex. This will be something that we mention again in chapter 17, but there are some important points for us to take from this. So there are five different properties that we're looking at here, specificity, nature of the signal. So for those two, uh, those should be pretty self-evident if you've been kind of paying attention up until this point in this chapter in terms of the difference between electrical signaling and hormonal signaling. The two that we really want to pay attention to in terms of kind of novelty for us is speed and duration of action. So don't even look at this table. Let me just ask you a quick question. What do you think is going to be faster in terms of delivery of a message? A message that is delivered electrically or a message that is delivered through the blood? You're naturally going to say an electrical message, right? And you are absolutely correct about that. So in terms of speed, in terms of how quickly a reflex action can occur, a neural reflex is going to be very, very, very fast because electrical messages get sent very, very quickly. So we can respond homeostatically uh, very quickly when that type of reflex is neural in nature. Conversely, an endocrine reflex is going to be much slower for several reasons. Number one, it takes time to make the hormone. It takes time to secrete the hormone. It takes time for that hormone to spread throughout the blood and to circulate and to find its receptors on target cells. And then once the hormone binds, it takes some time for the cell to produce its response. So endocrine reflexes are much, much slower. But there is a give and a take that has to do with the duration of action. So for a neural reflex, we talk about how speed-wise it happens very quickly, but the give and take there is that a neural reflex will also end very quickly. Neural reflexes do not last very long because they happen so very quickly. Endocrine reflexes last quite a bit longer. So the responses are going to last quite a bit longer for kind of the same reason. The response will last for as long as the hormone is in the blood and interacting with receptors. And getting that hormone cleared out of the blood is going to take some time. So these endocrine reflexes tend to happen for quite a while. A perfect example of this, if we kind of go back to the childbirth scenario, uh, so once the baby is born, right, there's obviously no more pressure on the cervix and no more stimulus. In spite of that, uterine contractions will continue for a little bit of time afterwards, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour, it's just going to kind of depend. So why is the uterus continuing to contract even though the baby is no longer there putting pressure on the cervix, keeping this loop going? Well, the key issue is that oxytocin is still in the blood. And as long as oxytocin is still in the blood, 
the uterus is going to continue to contract. So contractions will not stop until that oxytocin has been cleared out. So to conclude here, a neural signal will reach its target very quickly, but the response won't last very long. An endocrine signal takes quite a while to reach its target, but the response will last much longer. And then I don't really have anything in particular to say about this table. You may just want to highlight or bookmark this slide because this is a very good quick reference for comparing and contrasting the three types of reflexes that we have talked about so far. So if you can get yourself to the point where you can pretty easily understand a table like this, you should be in phenomenal shape. So that is going to do it for our uh, unit on communication in the body. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I certainly hope you will join us for next time when we start talking about the endocrine system. So I will see you then. Bye-bye.